Today is Wednesday, December 12th, 2018. My name is Anne Peskin. It is my honor and privilege today to interview Robin Stein for the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County. Good morning. Good morning. Please tell me your name. Um, my legal name is Robert M. Stein, Jr. And but I go by Robin. Uh, when were you born? January 20, 1942. And where were you born? New York City. How did you find that family get to America? I, my, most of my family actually came in the 1850s, obviously a long time ago. My maternal grandfather did immigrate from Austria, um, so there was one, one my um, maternal grandfather was an immigrant. The rest of them had been here for generations. Why did they come? Uh, because it's so long ago, we're not sure. Um, it might have been for persecution um, or just um, for economic reasons, or they just wanted were adventurous because they one one ended up in California at gold rush days and another part of the branch uh, ended up in San Antonio when you got to where they lived by stagecoach. Interesting. Now your parents, um, tell me a little about them. What okay. did they do? Well, at first, again I don't know how this works, but this is a wedding picture of myself and my wife, and those are my, that's my father and mother. And how did your parents earn a living? Uh, my father was a businessman, it was in the family business um, called uh, Stein Hall and Company, started in Chicago, then moved uh, to New York, and they were importers and manufacturers. My mother was a housewife in those days, I guess that's what we and uh, did your parents have any political beliefs? Uh, emphatic yes. <laughs> they were liberal. Um, uh, they were very, very active. Uh, locally, we lived in Briarcliff Manor, which was a very conservative area at that time. Uh, I remember hearing about John Birch Society, McCarthy, um, but my parents, uh, were not uh, cowed by that. My mother did run for a board of education, not successfully, but did run at one time. And my parents were particularly um, active in civil rights. Um, they developed programs in Alabama. They were in Alabama in the, in the 60s. My father marched on Selma. My mother um, developed a camp program for disadvantaged children from the South, starting with the, I think it was four or five young girls who were blinded in the terrible bombing in uh, Alabama. Others died, but the ones who were, so she found camps for the blind where they could come during the summer. And then was she, she could, living in Alabama at that time? No, we lived in Varka, but they went down in the summers. And then she developed the program, had a whole network of camps and support. Very Tell us about your early family life. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Um, this is the house we were raised, raised in. My parents, uh, I think it was my grandfather gave them the land. He was a real estate lawyer and he uh, uh, bought some land for speculation during the Depression. I think it was like a, I think it was less than $100 an acre in Briarcliff. Um, and they built, which rich, they were both from New York, and so they originally built um, a house for summer and for weekends. Uh, it was uh, a Bauhaus design, so I remember hearing that a neighbor said, I don't mind your house because the trees block it. Uh, and uh, it was actually um, in architectural record as an avant-garde house. Unfortunately, it was a, it's no longer there. It was one of these uh, houses that, Somebody decided they needed bigger and better and they tore it down. 
but so anyway, I was raised um, in Briarcliff. We were sort of in the idyllic in the woods, but somewhat isolated. So, you know, my friends were somewhat distant, but spent a lot of time when I was young just with my two sisters walking, walking, exploring in the woods. I liked to uh, fish uh, with my friends. We played ba a lot of baseball together. Um, and the other big thing which continued was a uh, love of gardening. My parents had a victory garden. We had chickens. Uh, and for a while I was to take care of the chickens until the foxes and the dogs got the better of them and then we decided it was just too much. But I've actually been a gardener. I, I try to retire from that, but my wife doesn't. So if you see a small patch of corn in Belltown, where it definitely doesn't belong, that's mine. Um, so gardening, I spent a lot of time as, as a youngster uh, gardening. You went to school there? Went to Briarcliff Public School from kindergarten to 12th grade. It was not a one-room schoolhouse, but it was all in one building. Um, so I went public schools, um, which in elementary school, I enjoyed it. Um, starting in about eighth grade, I was pretty miserable and uh, felt sort of an out socially, uh, somewhat of an outsider in high school. It may be based indirectly on the fact that I was maybe one or two people of Jewish uh, background um, and obviously everybody else was either Protestant or Catholic um, or and I didn't really get academically inspired to the chagrin of my parents until I went to college but never too late I guess. Describe that your home as far as the Jewish uh, observances. Okay. Um, I was raised um, in the Ethical Culture Society. Um, uh, my mother did have a Jewish background. She was, she always said that it was confirmed she was in a Reformed temple as opposed to a mitzvah, but anyway, she went through that process. But, um, but my father's um, parents and maybe and grandparents were of that generation who came from Germany and Eastern Europe and wanted to be very secular, not denying their Jewish background. Um, and my father's um, parents were among, among the group that helped found the ethical culture movement. So I was raised in that. We, we knew we were Jewish. Um, Hanukkah and Passover, we, you know, did some minimal things to, um, and some of our, we went to some of our friends and relatives, religious, uh, but I didn't have a Jewish um, upbringing, so to speak. So you were in No, I was not Bamitz. My sister was at the age of 65 in a Reconstruction. She's a member, active member of Reconstructionist Temple in New York. Okay. What kind of general education? You started, you were not too happy as far as high school. Now what happened in college that they thought about such change? Um, I just um, liked my courses. Um, I did my undergraduate work um, at the University of Michigan. Um, it may have been good to get away from the local environment, I'm not sure. Um, and I wasn't sure. Initially, I was always very interested in the environment and conservation. So I started there in the they called School of Conservation. But I guess the love from my parents of liberal arts, so I ended up being a liberal arts, actually a history major, but did take some conservation courses. Um, and then went to the University of Pennsylvania for graduate school, um, got a degree in city planning. At some point, really my <coughs> senior year, and, and Michigan, some of the things I were interested in, was interested in like conservation and being close to New York City and being very concerned about social issues sort of led me to city planning. Which is where you ended up. Yes. Tell us about your married <coughs> life and starting the family. Okay, so 
again. Well, you already saw this the picture. That's my wife and I. 1981, we, we married. Um, and married here. Um, in Stanford? Um, in, well, my parents had moved to Pleasantville, New York, so actually we had the ceremony at my parents' house. Um, I had been previously in the Peace Corps in Chile. Um, after I graduated, did my graduate work, I went to the Peace Corps. Um, and had great, great experience. I mean, somewhat life-changing in many respects. Um, fell in love with the country. Um, fell in love, but not on any uh, long-term basis with the, the women down there. Um, and then I came back to the United States in, um, actually, after the Peace Corps, I actually worked for the Chilean Housing Ministry in housing for a while. Then I came back to the United States, uh, and they had a military coup in 1973, and I had a number of friends who were affected by that. Um, and I <coughs> got very active in Amnesty International. There was a local chapter here in uh, Stanford, and and also on a national basis, obviously my focus was always on Chile. And then in 1976, when the U.S., and that's a long story of why, finally, because of Nixon, it was the Nixon-Kissinger years, and they were not, they were pleased with the military coup, not pleased with the former government, but they agreed to accept some political refugees from Chile, um, pressures from other countries. You want us to take Vietnamese refugees, so what have you done for the Chile? It's like, so anyway, my wife, uh, came as a political refugee. She had been active in the student movement. She had been briefly imprisoned and badly treated by the military police. She was at that point, her first marriage and her husband was imprisoned uh, for over a year. Um, they had had a child and they were given the choice by uh, this program, either accept a visa and leave or stay in prison and suffer. So they opted out. U.S. was not their first choice, but they ended up in the United States. Um, and we, with my parents and the ethical culture, developed a community um, center for them in New York, the refugees, so they could learn some English, get some help in housing and in jobs. And I met her, uh, the story is her marriage broke up or her husband moved to uh, uh, Spain where he's uh, with his new family and um, we met, that's how we met and eventually we got married. And how long have you been married? Since 1981. Today's our anniversary. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, any children? We have, we have three children. Daughter Sylvia. Um, uh, I don't even want to think about how old she is because that makes me old. But anyway, and she has a, a son, so we have a grandson, Mateo. Uh, she lives in Stanford. He goes to TOR. He was in KT Murphy, so he's going through the school system. Uh, uh, she works for a, a, a pharmacy uh, doing billing issues, and she also worked this year for the Register of Voters when they needed somebody. She was much loved by them, I believe. Um, love to get her a full-time job somewhere, but anyway, because she, she is a single mom. Um, middle son is Guido. Um, he lives in, uh, well, outside of Boston, Somerville, Mass. Um, he's married. Um, his wife is uh, is Jewish, so there is there is that still that connection. Um, they have a dog, and I, we think that's as far as it's going to be. His wife is, um, I think, second generation. Her grandparents were Holocaust survivors. So, uh, and, the and the youngest is David. Uh, um, he is. Um, 
He's going to George Washington University. He's getting a master's in project management. He also works uh, full time for a nonprofit doing development work. Um, he is married, uh, and he was also in the Peace Corps. He went to Armenia, and he not a, he fell in love more with an Armenian than Armenia, but no, nothing against Armenia. Um, and he has a lovely, lovely wife. And this. I guess this is sort of an extended family. Um, obviously, myself, my wife, that's Mateo, the grandson, daughter, Guido, David, Genia, that's his um, wife, uh, who's also getting a master's degree, and that's my sister, Helen. Nice picture. Uh, my older sister, Elizabeth, is deceased. Uh, we have a fortunate history of cancer in the family. Now you've talked about being all around the world. When did you finally get to Fairfield County? Um, of course, I wasn't very far uh, where I was raised. Um, and my parents, not my parents, my father's family had a weekend and summer place off of Hillcrest Park, which is right off of Palmer's Hill Road, right. you know, half of the properties in Greenwich Hat. Um, so they had a place, so my father was spent quite a Bit of his time uh, in Stanford, so I guess it was that that connection. He, he remembers a horse and buggy going to the railroad stations. So he remembered. Um, after after I came back um, from from Chile, then I started looking for a job. An associate from Penn told me about a position in Stanford, uh, assistant planning and zoning director. I applied and got the job. That was in '74 and been mostly with the city ever since, which is a very long time. Have you retired? I, I tried once, apparently got a failing grade, <laughs> and I'm now working part-time as a special assistant to the mayor, um, three days a week, and I, I did it. I have another, I have, and I guess about to be had, a second job with the state uh, chairman of the Connecticut Siting Council. I do it telecommunication and energy facilities um, appointed by my former boss at Stanford, Mayor Malloy, who is well, still the governor, um, but I'm leaving with the governor. I, I resigned from that position. That's good. What was the city like when you moved here? No, that was 1981? 74. 74. Uh, well, urban renewal was just starting, so there were, I remember the circular building, the <coughs> St. John's Towers had just been built, um, but there was still a lot of vacant land. I think when I got here, a landmark had been built, but none of the other office buildings. And the South End was very industrial. I mean, Yale Town, had, they had left, but their buildings were still there. And Pitney Bowes was very active in the South End. Probably North Stanford was not much different. I mean, it filled in a little bit, but it was. Um, and, you know, there was the Glenbrook and, and Springdale, which also had filled in as, as denser, and we had, um, you know, and we still do some poverty, and then primarily in the west side and the south end. Um, so it was, which is what I liked about it, it was a very diverse community, it still is. What do you think about the changes that have been down in the South End? Um, I would say mostly for the better, um, considering what it was. And, you know, people seem to have short memories. There's now a big battle over what to do with a, a site. Well, until a few years ago, it was BNS Carding. And trucks lined up, garbage. And now it's about to become housing, and people are concerned that too much housing. And there, you know, there are issues. I mean, development creates issues. I'm not that pleased with the architecture. It's, I think it's getting boring, other than the Yale Town renovation. Um, I think we had a real opportunity to do a sustainable neighborhood there, and we didn't. I mean, it is in a sense that. It's high density and you can walk to the station and we do have a fairway, which I'm very proud of. One of the things we fought for to get a 
wanted a downtown supermarket, but at least we got one in the south end. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, it's a it's a mixed bag. But think of where Stanford had would have been during the last Great Recession if we didn't have building going on, which was primarily down in the south end. You talked about your first, was your first job your only job? Because I know you've continued for many years. Um, yes, I mean, I had, briefly I was a consultant and I worked up in uh, Niagara Falls for the city of Niagara Falls. I've done it for a couple of years. But basically it's been with the city first as an assistant planning and zoning director and then as director and then they changed the title of the land use bureau chief. Um, but. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I, I had a wonderful experience, but it was just summer working at, sort of as a volunteer professional in Tanzania. Uh, uh, but, but basically it's been with the city of Stanford. Does your spouse work? Um, my spouse is an artist, um, and uh, so she, she works very hard, but uh, definitely a nonprofit. <laughs> And she's also um, promoted some theater uh, projects. Um, she did work for the Connecticut Commission on the Arts, um, promoted particularly um, artists of um, either minorities or, or recent immigrants. She did that a number of years. And she, her main job right now is we have a place down in Chile, um, which is a, a former mansion in ruins, which she fell in love with, and we restored it. We, I say we, I, you know, I, I sent the uh, Western Union you know, money, but she, she did a, a fabulous, fabulous job. It's in a small town on the coast. It has a cultural art museum as part of it and a bed and breakfast. That was my idea. We need to at least make a little money. Well, it's a true nonprofit, um, but she spends a considerable amount of time either there or now with the advances where you can, uh, you know, Skype and other things uh, working there. Interesting. Um, are you involved in, a, in community in any way? Um, obviously through my work I've been very, very much involved. Um, I've been involved with um, several housing, mutual housing um, association, whatever it's called, that is part of the original members of that. They built the Parkside Gables on the west side um, and some other developments. And um, when we had a housing coalition, which we've had it and we've lost it and we've had it, I've been involved, uh, very much involved um, in that. Um, I belong to a sister city project uh, with a city in um, um, Nicaragua, Nagarote. It's technically, it's a Norwalk, Nagarote, but it's it's a much larger than uh, Norwalk. So I've been involved in that um, organization almost, almost from day one. Um, mentioned Amnesty International, um, Sustainable Stanford, which was an organization set up by uh, Mayor Malloy, which unfortunately we need to get it started again, but I'm very much involved in that because um, sustainability environment is still a very high priority. Did you experience any anti-Semitism in your work or outside? I don't remember any overt anti-Semitism directed at me. I think some of the reason, and there were probably other reasons based on my own personality, that I felt somewhat alone when I was growing up in Barcliffe Manor and um, I sort of heard, you know, some some comments, but not directed. I think there was there was some there. I mean, I had also the other other problem is try to explain what ethical culture is to a fellow classmate, and you know that was like particularly it's, it's you know it's sort of progressive progressive movement, and uh, as I mentioned, that those were the John Birch uh, McCarthy days. So I and in my work, I don't again I don't remember overtly. I know there was some occasionally uh, or very rarely, but I'd hear sort of in, down when I was in Chile, you know, Jews killed Christ, some of that. But 
I didn't I didn't feel the direct attack on me. I think one girlfriend when she found out I was Jewish was maybe not so sure. But here no 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 problem in Stanford in any way. I, I haven't. I mean the history is my um, Cherry Lawn School, which um, was actually founded on, on the, my grandparents' property on Hillcrest Park. Uh, my uncle founded it and then it ultimately moved to Dar Darien. I still don't know how Darien let it in because talk about a progressive uh, education. But I remember um, my uncle um, Str Strasser, he, he couldn't buy a house in Darien. They ended up living. Stanford, and my uh, cousin Karen still does, Karen Strasser still, well it's now Karen Holtzman, so, so I mean there was, oh, but didn't affect me directly. And I'm assuming that the Jewish, being Jewish, did or didn't help you at all? I think it helped me in that I feel very strongly that my heritage, both in the love of education and in doing good deeds and being involved in the community comes certainly in large part because of Jewish background. What, what wars did you live through? Um, oh, one other thing, I, just on my education, and this was in my adult, I did take the Melton, I did go through that program. I had, I had two goals, I satisfied one, not the other. First goal was to learn more about Judaism because I felt and still feel like really wanted to have more of that background. And I also wanted to get closer to the religion spiritually in that. I still have trouble with two things. I have trouble with the, um, the Old Testament God. I just, and, um, and I also have, and I, we discussed that in class, but I have trouble with the concept of chosen people um, because I think too many people and tribes think they're chosen, um, but we, we went through that. But so anyway, I, sorry to dig I digress, but was important for me. To what was the coming back? What was did you? Uh, oh, the wars. Um, well, as a small child, the Korean War, which I was really interested in military strategy as a young child, and so on. So the Korean War. Um, and then uh, obviously the Vietnam War. Was, you were. I mean, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't. Didn't go in the service, but certainly living through that mm -hmm. period of time. Um, and then subsequently we've had the continual wars: Iraq and Afghanistan. Did it affect your life at all? Um, again, not directly, because I went in the Peace Corps. And, I went to graduate school and then went in the Peace Corps. Um, but certainly friends, and I certainly, when I came back, were involved in the various peace movements. Uh, what do you do in your spare time, if there is any? Uh, trying to regain my spare time. So I am interested in genealogy. Uh, this was done by a cousin of mine rather flowery thing, but the, this is on my mother's side, the hamburgers, uh, which if you read the fine print, he said we descended straight from Moses. Uh, it could be true. Uh, incidentally, my wife did one of those uh, DNA and found that she had a little bit of, uh, I guess, uh, Eastern, or maybe not even, but J Jewish DNA. And, she now thinks that her, some part of her family may have been originally in Spain and then, you know, converted during the Inquisition. Uh, so genealogy is something I'm, I'm interested in, but it's difficult, so I get really interested and then I take a break. <laughs> um, and uh, I still like to, to fish. I've uh, become, I wouldn't say a very good one, but a fly fisherman, and every year I go with my two sons, we just came back from North Carolina and got to go fishing. Um, you make the flies? Hmm? You make the flies? I tried. I'm not very good. With my wife's help, we made a few flies, but I, um, 
Uh, so let me see, what else do I do? Um, I'm Tai Chi, I have a very good friend here in Stanford, uh, Jay Fountain. You know, we've also traveled together with family. Our kids were roughly the same age. And he got me into Tai Chi, um, and it's very, very, very good for me. And uh, we have a, a great uh, a master. Um, I like going to the theater and concerts when I can afford it, because New York just seems like. Um, and, uh, I like reading, I like to travel, and I'm still still doing some gardening. So what? Gardening. Um, what inventions uh, have you lived to see, and which ones are the most amazing to you? I thought that was a challenging question, the first part of it, because there are all kinds of inventions <laughs> that I've lived to see that we take for granted. So I'm not, so the list would be very long, but first thing I can remember being really um, excited about was transistor radio. I remember, um, I'm a, I like to watch certain sports, uh, soccer and I've always baseball, so I remember World Series being able to take the transistor radio to school. We couldn't turn it on in school for the World Series, but right after school, we, you know, we didn't even have to run home, we could just turn it on. Uh, so that was, that was something uh, that I that I remembered. I mean, I was TV was already just starting. I mean, we had three channels, so it wasn't like a, a new invention uh, to me. Um, but certainly, anything to do with space and space travel is obviously you know brand new for the early rockets. I was I was in Chile when they had the the first. Uh, I'm sure on the first walk, walk on the moon, I was in with some socialist uh, senators, and they said, congratulations, but we wish the Russians had beat you. <laughs> That's a tough. <laughs> uh, uh, in work, I mean, uh, going from the electric typewriter to word processor, I guess it would be at Wang and things, and not having to not only make six carbon copies, but you know, if you had to do uh, white out, you know, I mean, it's just what a, you know, what a, what a, what a change. And so many things um, with the computer, uh, particularly interested in GIS, geographic uh, mapping. My older son, well, that's his field. Um, what you what you could do by by mapping and, and bringing all the all the information, demographics. Uh, Ecological, all and you know layers, and put it all together is just amazing. Because of my um, work with the state, I'm fascinated by the advances in solar energy and wind energy and um, everything to do with renewable energy. So you know all these, I think, are just uh, fascinating. And of course, the internet is, which um, you know, I was born in the wrong century. There's so much there and. Want to look up a word? Where's the dictionary? But but that is right there on your. <laughs> anyway. What would you, you tell? You, well, well, we've mentioned your children and grandchildren. What would you want to tell about them? Anything special? About them. Mm. Um, they're. I mean, I'm, I'm very pleased with the way they've turned out. Um, to only take a tiny bit of credit for that. I mean, they're, um, they're all working in areas where they're also giving back to the community um, in, you know, in different ways. Particularly my two oldest ones have had challenges because they're both uh, dyslexic. Um, in addition, I think my older son is ADHD. My wife, Hated to admit it, but she was, so we have it in the family. I've been fought unsuccessfully with the Board of Education and the school system with my two older kids because I was totally clueless. And so that's, I, I wish I could have done more earlier. My grandson, I've been trying still, but learned that you hire an advocate if you can afford it and you can, you know, you can, and he's 
he's doing, but because he, he's also dyslexic and has ADHD, so they they have challenges. Challenges, but despite that, they have really you know overcome them. I'm going to go outside our questions and ask you, with the Mill River Park, were you involved at all with it? Yes, I, I wanted to just real quickly, not to top my horn, but mention some of the achievements. One is yes, working with Mill River Park. I mean, my predecessor came up with the John Smith concept, I mean, years and years ago, and then it just, nothing, nothing much happened. So I, um, you know, with obviously support of others, pushed it forward and were able to get federal and state money, and, you know, got the project to remove the dam, and then I was, you know, one of the founding members of the Mill River Collaborative, the private-public partnership, uh, which is flourishing, and, you know, they just opened the skating rink, and there's more. Um, I hope they don't cover every piece of it with a building, but hopefully not. Um, and I actually go there every day. We go with our, our dog who chases the geese. Um, when we're there, and then of course the geese come back as soon as we leave, but we do our best. Um, and I just want to mention that in my sort of achievements was particularly working with children, working with children because this, the uh, playground was designed really by kids. We, we had a professional, but he went to the schools, blank piece of paper, what do you want? And they said it, and he drew it up, and then we had another meeting where the kids brought their parents, is this what you want, and from that, and then we we had kids, and it was a community build, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and also the skate park up at Scousey, we had, pro we, the community had problems with the skateboarders going, you know, all over downtown, and, and we, we met with them and said, well, what is it you want? And they said, we want a place not to be harassed by the police or anything where we can, and they not only helped with the design because they were the pros in skateboarding, but we got them said, we need money, so we need you guys to go to the Board of Finance and the Board of Reps. And they did it unanimous, you know, nothing ever is unanimous, they got unanimous uh, approval. The last thing, when we did the 2002 master plan, we had a special section, which I really, really wanted to do with the schools, um, the master plan. So we had both schools at the elementary and the middle school level where they did specific projects. And in the case of KT Murphy, they did a model and were determined that they had very little playground space and found out they had the smallest area. So they actually proposed that it, if any of the adjacent properties ever came uh, on sale, that the city should buy them and expand it. Well, five or six years later, that's what happened. One of the property, the property owner remembered, he gave the city the first right of refusal. By then the kids were in high school, the same, these were fourth graders. They went to the board meetings, and today they've got the expanded uh, playground, so exciting about, excited about that. That's that kind of thing, is, you know, for, for for the next generation, because that's and part of why we're here. What would your advice be to the future generations? Oh, um, uh, I used to think this is that, you know, happiness was sort of the key. Uh, there's a poem, I think an Emerson poem on happiness, which I uh, copied. But then I read um, uh, Victor Frankl's book, uh, The Meaning of, of Life, Man's Meaning. Uh, and living a meaningful, meaningful life, whatever, you know, not narrowly defined, I think is the important thing. Find meaning, and whether it's in in your relationships with people, in your work, or in some hobby or something you do, but you find meaning, then hopefully happiness and other things will come. So I think um, searching for meaning, meaning in life is you know it's a little esoteric. Um, we should all remember that we were once a child, so as my kids get older, <coughs> don't forget. Um, I think listening, we got ears, so we should listen. I like saying I don't remember them usually, but a, um, a mind's like an umbrella, it works best when it's open. 
it's not not easy in these days. And also, the final thing is from, I think it's former Secretary of State Henry Stimson. I couldn't find the whole quote, but he said, "The only deadly sin I know is cynicism, which is very hard in this world not to be cynical. But if we're going to move forward, we have to put the cynicism aside." Thank you very much. Can I just go ahead? Just quickly, because he's just doing. One is I'm an adopted member of the Mandan Indian tribe, and I also climbed the Matterhorn when I was 16. So, you know, just something you wouldn't think Robin Stein would necessarily. No. <laughs> no. Well, thank you so much for joining us and being interviewed. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I've been talking about this with my family, and they said, well, you got to do it. Actually, I've been doing it with a World War II veteran, and we did do a did an oral, oral series of oral yes. interviews. He's now 95. But Is there anything that you want to show us that you didn't? Oh. Uh, well, if you want to see what I looked like when I was young and handsome working in the city of Stanford some years ago, that was a, that was a picture taken probably 15 years ago. So. Um, and uh, This is my maternal grandmother. It was beautiful, as was my mother. And this was my paternal grandfather, who I never get had a chance to meet because he died in the influenza, influenza, influenza epidemic, the flu epidemic in 1918. Uh, and this last summer, we had a family reunion. Uh, I can, we're, we're over in this part, but this was our extended family with cousins, starting with my generation. The generation senior to mine is no longer with us, but so. Where was this taken? This was taken in the state of Washington um, on the co uh, coast. The uh, former military base has been converted into sort of a uh, place where you can stay in officers' quarters and um, so. Um, I think let me have some. Uh, oh, this because it's a little bit different because of my work with Amnesty International. This was an award I got from the, the Chilean, the post-military Chilean government about you know helping to do what one could to restore democracy there. So, uh, that's something. Pretty, pretty much. Well, thank you. Yeah, again, thank you. Tell us about Cherry Lawn School. Okay. Uh, my understanding is it was started by um, uh, my, well, I guess a great, or maybe great, great uncle. Uh, Fred Goldfrank. He had uh, studied at Harvard to be a, a physician, had a medical degree from Harvard. Um, and just after he graduated, um, my aunt, uh, uh, B. or Beatrice Stein, and then became when she married Estigno, came down with polio and was paralyzed from the leg down from her waist down and he was very close to her um, um, Fred Goldfrank and he couldn't make her better because you know once you get polio unfortunately you can't but he decided well do the next best thing and be her private tutor and out of that I believe came the concept of you know a school not just for her and at that time by the family, um, which would be my grandparents, had, um, had what they called their summer weekend home over on Hill, Hillcrest Park um, off of Palmer's Hill. Um, actually, they, I think they had a complex, several family members. Anyway, he started teaching there. I believe there was a cherry tree uh, and on their big lawn and it started the school. My father and some cousins were the first students. It obviously grew. And then eventually, um, the school moved and prospered in Darien for a number of years. What years are we talking about? 
um, this would have been the early 1900s, so it would have been about, I'm guessing around 1915 or so, up until I think through the 60s, maybe into the 70s. Then it was, the property was eventually either sold or given to the, uh, the town of Darien. Um, there are fascinating stories about Uncle Fred. I know one, one, one story I remember is even in the winter, he would have the children sleep out on the open porch. He wanted them to be learn to, to face the trials and tribulations. Um, but he had a sweeter side, I understand, too. It was a boarding school. It was a boarding school, yeah. I mean, there may have been. And they had, it wasn't just people of progressive. I believe they had, some of the professors had escaped communism. They were what were called in those days white Russians, um, you know, anti-communists, but had professional backgrounds. I think some those taught as well as some very, you know, uh, progressive or even left-wing um, teachers. Um, big emphasis on the classics, I think, and on liberal arts. Um, beyond that, I have to get you the, the booklet that uh, Chloe Strasser um, wrote because there are many more details. I never attended it, so I 